Welcome to People and Profit, your essential business briefing coming up. As Algeria's president delays elections and says he won't run for a fifth term, what does the turmoil mean for the country's economy? President Trump's budget wish list would see the deficit explode, but is that something to worry about? And giving a second life to your clothes, the French entrepreneur that's turning old shirts into new shorts. First up, though, to Algeria and the role of the economy in the protests against President Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Unemployment in the oil and gas rich country is officially almost 12%, and the rate among young people is more than double that. This in a country where two thirds of the population is under 30. A lack of diversification away from the oil and gas industries has meant limited opportunities for its young workforce. Well, to talk about this further, I'm joined in studio by Alexandre Kateb, who's a, an economist and an emerging markets uh, specialist. Can you give us an idea, first of all, we know that oil and gas is a huge industry in Algeria, but what other sectors are prominent in the economy? Well, uh, you know, the Algerian economy uh, is very much uh, dominated, as you say, the, by uh, oil and gas and traditional uh, sectors like the construction uh, sector, for example, which is uh, huge because there was a, a huge uh, construction drive and uh, uh, infrastructure projects over the, the last uh, 20 uh, years. Uh, so construction is very big. It's uh, about 15 percent of the, the economy and of the workforce. And then you have agriculture as well, which is uh, very large. You have uh, almost uh, one-tenth of the GDP mm -hmm. and uh, even more of the workforce that is uh, employed in agriculture. And there was a lot of investment in, uh, in agriculture over uh, the last uh, years. So uh, Algeria is actually self-sufficient uh, uh, in a few uh, steppers, uh, with the exception of uh, wheat, for example, which it has to import from uh, uh, Europe or North, North America or uh, Russia. Now, one of the challenges the country is facing is making the economy more diverse. This is something that you've worked on a report before as an independent expert for the Algerian government several years ago. What sort of recommendations were you making in that report of, of how to diversify the economy away from oil and gas? Yes. Uh, well, actually, uh, the, the main issue in Algeria is uh, that it is an economy that is dominated by the state and, and uh, public sector uh, enterprises. So, so basically, the, 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 the challenge is to shift this uh, uh, economy from one that is dominated by this uh, huge uh, state uh, monopolies uh, to one which is uh, uh, driven by the, the private sector. And in order to do this, uh, uh, we have to uh, first modernize the financial sector. Now the financial sector, for example, is dominated by uh, uh, government-owned banks. Uh, so it's difficult for, for a private sector to get financing when you are not connected uh, with the government, especially. And uh, also, it is uh, important uh, uh, to, to, to have uh, like a, a, a more transparent uh, business uh, uh, climate uh, to work on the doing business uh, you know, uh, dimension, uh, which uh, in Algeria is, is very low because of this dominance of the state and the public sector and this huge bureaucracy that controls uh, all the economy. So it has provided uh, uh, jobs and subsidies for the population, but on the other side, uh, it has a, a kind of uh, um, played against the development of the private sector. And are you hopeful then that whatever happens in the next few weeks in Algeria could lead to a change in that political will to do more to change the economy? I am, uh, I am uh, hopeful uh, if uh, we see uh, the government answering to these uh, demands from the, the, the yacht, from all these forces that, that really want uh, uh, more transparency in the system and that uh, really want uh, uh, to, to get a bigger stake, uh, so to say. Uh, but uh, in order for this to happen, uh, it needs uh, uh, a lot of political legitimacy. Uh, and it needs uh, to show that it is willing really to, to reform the system, so to suppress uh, all the laws that inhibit uh, uh, pr uh, private investment, uh, local or foreign uh, investment to the country, to show that it's willing to uh, modernize and privatize a, a part of the financial system uh, as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and this, uh, this is a, a huge task. And for that, uh, um, as I have written in a recent piece, uh, the, 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 the really the main idea is this uh, legitimacy. Mm. So uh, the government has to, to show that uh, it can uh, lead these reforms, which for some of them are unpopular reform. 
because when you suppress subsidies, when you uh, you put uh, uh, you know uh, higher price on on uh, uh, gasoline or on electricity, this is something that the people don't like. So uh, on the other hand, you have to give them more freedom, more freedom to invest, more access to finance, uh, more access to, to foreign uh, partners uh, without the state being uh, uh, in control of all, all these flows, actually. And how could, could the, the, what's happening at the moment in Algeria, is that going to affect how international investors feel about the country as well? Because it's been something, it's been difficult for Algeria to attract international investment until now. Yes, I mean, nobody really knows what will uh, come out of this uh, protest, uh, but I think that uh, uh, from what we have seen, these this peaceful uh, uh, marches, you know, um, uh, I think it would uh, actually uh, be a positive sign for investors because it could show them that in Algeria there is a will to change the system uh, without, uh, you know, falling into uh, what we have seen uh, in other uh, countries in the, in the, in the region. This, this chaos and anarchy and so on. Um, and if this goes this way, uh, but the government has to answer the demands of the uh, protesters, especially the, the young people. And so far, I think uh, it has to, 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 to go uh, much, uh, much uh, you know, further uh, in, in this direction. What we have seen is that uh, for the time being, we, we, we have the same people that are actually proposed uh, to manage uh, a political transition. And I think the, the, the young uh, generation, they don't want that. They don't really a radical change but a change that is uh, uh, peaceful and uh, that offers them more opportunities. Okay, Alexandre Kateb, economist, thank you very much for coming in to speak to us thank about you. this. Now, President Trump has laid out his wish list for US government spending for the next year. It's a record $4.7 trillion package that has almost no chance of being passed through the Democrat-controlled House of Representatives. The budget, nevertheless, envisages massive cuts to education and health spending, but more money for the military and over $8 billion for the border wall with Mexico. The plan would see the federal deficit rise and plans to balance the budget in 15 years instead of the usual 10. Washington has a spending problem and it endangers the future prosperity of our nation for generations to come. This budget contains nearly $2.7 trillion in savings, more spending reductions proposed than any administration in history. This budget will balance in 15 years. So does the size of the government deficit really matter? Kate Moody has been looking into this. Kate. Well, Stephen, a deficit occurs when the amount of government spending is higher than the amount it's bringing in, in tax revenue. Over the past 30 years, the US government has steadily run up that deficit especially as it spent more to boost the economy during the global financial crisis. The official figure for this fiscal year is $985 billion. Donald Trump's 2020 budget proposal would drive it up to $1.1 trillion. Now, the bigger the deficit, the deeper a government sinks into debt. When interest rates are low, it's easier to roll over that debt. Investors are generally confident that economies like the U.S. will pay its bills on time. So markets tend not to panic about those high numbers. Predictions show that the deficit, as compared to GDP, would sharply worsen in case of a recession. Most economists believe that periods of strong economic growth, like the U.S. is currently experiencing, should see government revenue at its highest and deficits low, leaving plenty of room for action like increased spending during a downturn. But that's not currently the case. The Trump administration's sweeping tax cuts saw a dip in revenue from both personal income taxes and corporate taxes. Concrete impact on economic growth remains fairly small for now, but it will drive up the deficit by nearly $2 trillion over the next decade. Politicians and economists have traditionally championed low deficits and debt loads. There are signs of change on both sides of the aisle because there's an argument that as long as the economy remains strong and the government makes its payments, the benefits can be worth that funding gap. But the overwhelming wisdom is that it's not sustainable in the long term, so deficits continue to spark debate. Stephen? Kate, thank you very much for that. Next to the story of a French entrepreneur who's turned old clothes into a new business. Tired of throwing away his worn out shirts, Sharif Hain found a way of recycling them into boxer shorts. He's joined forces with a French organisation that helps train the unemployed in the art of making clothes. Julia Seeger has the story. A range of colours and designs. 
All these boxer shorts were made from old collared shirts. Sheriff Hain came up with the idea in 2015 as he was going through his wardrobe. Instead of throwing away his old shirts, he thought of a way to give them a second life. We can't continue to pollute like this forever. The textile industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world, the second most polluting, I believe. So we really need to rethink the way we produce. Not giving in to the so-called fast fashion is a good way to change the world and make it a better place. Over 100 pieces have already been created by the company's workers. Sherif gets the old shirts from a recycling center as three of them are needed to make one pair of boxer shorts. It's a really creative job because we have to make underwear with these shirts and we're given some creative freedom. It's really interesting for us. The boxer shorts are made in the sewing workshop in Chartres, south of Paris, which trains unemployed people in how to make clothes. At any given time, Sherif employs 17 people who work on a two-year training contract. Some employees who started making underwear out of shirts left, but before leaving, they trained the people who replaced them, so passing on their knowledge. Some people got here and didn't know how to sew, and today they've developed that skill. Each pair of these environmentally friendly boxer shorts cost around 40 euros. Well, that's it from us for now, but you can always find the best of our business coverage on our Facebook page, France 24 Business, or you can tweet me with your comments at New Stephen. Until next time, thanks for watching. We are journalists and normally you have to listen to us, but you have things to tell us too. Maybe you've experienced a dramatic event, or you've got something important to say. You want to make a difference. That is why we created The Observers. Now, the first step is very easy. You get in touch with our team. Send us your images, tell us what you've seen. And then it's our job to get your voice out there, on our site, on social networks, on your mobiles and tablets, and on TV, of course. You can appear in our weekly show via webcam. Or perhaps we'll come see you in person, where you live, in your country, your town, and we'll work together on a report for our investigative show, The Observer's Direct. So you get the idea. This show is your show, your way to get your voice out to the world.